Guten Abend, ich heiße John und äh, bin vorne aus Schottland. Äh, ich habe Deutsch äh, an die Schule gelernt vor 20 Jahren, als, als ich an die erste Höhe mein Deutsch ist gar nicht gut. Also äh, ich dachte, dass äh, ich muss dieses auf Englisch vor seinen Ohren zudrehen. <laughs> so I'll move into English. And uh, yeah, that, that pretty much was the limit of my journey. So. <laughs> Um, I just want to do a quick check because I spoke to a few people before we started. Could I see a show of hands? How many people have used MongoDB? Okay. Just to embarrass you, how many people have it? Did you not say you have it? I said I'm primarily a sequel. Primarily a Did you not say earlier you hadn't heard of it? No. Somebody else. Okay, I mistook, that explains that. I mistook you for somebody else who came ah, in and said, okay, what's a long Okay, okay. <laughs> okay um, so I will, this is a, an intermediate level talk, so I'm assuming that you know something about long um, I, I could have, if there had been a, a more people unfamiliar, I could have done a more basic introduction. Um, I, I worked for 20 years uh, on the fringes of the intelligence industry. So police and intelligence agencies in um, UK, Middle East, America have been using uh, document-based databases, um, not XML databases, not JSON databases, but a very similar concept since 1978 um, when they were originally built in hardware. So uh, I it was a company started in Scotland that really only sold into those organisations. Um, I ended up as CTO of that organisation and left it six months ago to come to MongoDB because they were moving away from the whole document model and uh, I wanted to stay with it. But what I brought to this talk, there's a lot I learned in that time, and a lot of ways that we used document-based databases, particularly in finding information about people. So most of the examples I will give you here will be about people, um, but the techniques can be applied to other things. So <clears throat> fuzzy searching, where do you use fuzzy searching? You use it when your query does not match your data, <clears throat> which seems wrong to start with. The idea is that your data should match the query, but it doesn't. And there could be three reasons. The first one is the data is wrong. The query is correct. But the data actually is wrong. The second one is that the data is correct but the query is wrong. And the third one, more subtle, is that the query is too specific and therefore doesn't exactly match any piece of data. So who has this problem? Lots of people actually have this problem. The big place that we see this are in fraud investigation because when people put in an insurance claim, they lie. When they give details, they lie. And they lie subtly. They just change things a little bit because it will beat the system. And the enterprise customer view, big organizations have many databases. And the problem is that those many databases all describe the same person in slightly different ways. And when they want one view of that person, it's difficult because no one search is going to find everything. And of course, law enforcement and intelligence, because they have people who very deliberately lie, change their name, swap things around, and try not to be found. So I'm going to talk about four problems today. The first problem is the misheard name. The thing about names is they're very easy to hear wrong. Uh, if, I, if I ask you all to call out your name and I wrote it down, bearing in mind that you know, I speak a little bit of German, I would still not spell half of them correctly. They're very easy to hear wrong, they're very easy to type wrong, especially when you go outside your own culture. So you could probably all correctly spell a German name, and I might correctly spell an English name, but I have very little chance of spelling names in other languages. And you see this um, regularly. If, if, like me, you travel and you go to Starbucks, you'll know they write something on the cup. The something they write on the cup at the top is supposed to be your name. 
It's not. There's a whole website dedicated to what people have written on Starbucks cups. This one, apparently the name is Helen. H-E-L-E-N. But um, no. So what you need is the ability to search by sound. Not Google or Siri style, I speak and it searches, that stuff's me. But what I want to do is to be able to write something down and find everything that sounds like how I think what I've written sounds. It's been a problem that's been around for a very long time. The, the solution is to use a phonetic <coughs> algorithm. Um, and the phonetic algorithm takes a string and it puts out one or more other strings. The trick it does is that the input, if the two input strings sound the same, the output string should be the same. So it maps it to a canonical version, to a version which is the same for all things that sound the same. The first one of these um, was used for a big data problem in 1931 called the US Census. So they actually invented something called the Soundex algorithm for processing data in the 1931 US Census. It's a terrible algorithm and that's why it's still the standard that's used throughout most relational databases. <laughs> um, there are some much better ones available as external libraries. For most of Europe um, and for the United States, my favourite is one called uh, Metaphone 2, which was developed in the uh, 1980s, I believe. Um, and that's the one I'll use throughout these examples. Um, in America, they really don't like things that have been created in Europe. The Metaphone algorithm was developed in Europe. Uh, in fact, they don't th like things that were developed outside their own state. So every state and every agency has its own unique algorithm for doing this, which of course, when they then start to bring all the data together, you can forget about having any sound-alike search capability. Um, in this part of the world, and going somewhat east from here, I believe the Deitch Mokhitov algorithm is the best one to use. It's certainly the one that works best with Germanic roots, but your own uh, research and investigation will tell you what works best. So how do you use this with MongoDB? Well, here's an example first, and I should say that um, I have an application front end that I built to demonstrate all of these techniques. It's available on GitHub, as is the white paper that describes all of this in detail. So if you want to use any of these, I'd advise you to download the code and play with it, get the white paper. In here, I've searched for the name John. <coughs> I've asked for all matching that sound like John. And you see that I found Joanna, John, Johnny, Joni, many names that sound like John. How this is done, is I have an additional field in the database. So I have the first name field, but in addition I have the S first name field, which contains that string which is, comes out of the algorithm. And so the name John maps to J-N-A-N, and the name Juan also maps to J-N-A-N, as do all of these different names. It means that when I come to query, I take the word that I've been given, I pass it through the same algorithm and get out J-N-A-N, and then I query on the sound-alike field rather than the name field, and I find all the results that sound like what I'm searching for. Did that make sense? Everybody follow that? It's actually a technique, as I say, it's been used in data processing since the 1930s, it's been used in relational databases for a very long time indeed. But because it's not a built-in primitive of MySQL, uh, you can shoot me if I do that again, of, of MongoDB, then um, it's one that a lot of MongoDB users are unfamiliar with. So the next problem is what we call the careless typist. And this is a great problem. Basically, users type badly. Um, in a previous life, I did an audit of data that had been entered into a customer system. This was a police system, one of the largest police forces in the world. And 30% of records had a typing error in a critical field, typically a name field. So that's how bad it can be. It is a very different problem to solve. 
because John does not sound like Coke and Smith does not sound like Smyrna. They will have very different outputs from a symbol like Amarillo, but in fact they're just a, a finger moved on the keyboard. Great example I had of this was working in the Middle East, where we were talking about how data can be misspelled and how there are techniques for finding bad spelling. I was told, you know, the most common name is Muhammad. Unlike in the West, where there are 50 ways, in Arabic there was only one way to spell Muhammad. So the customer was confident there would only be one spelling of Muhammad in their database. Well, that might be the case, but I can tell you that there are at least 26 different ways to mistype Muhammad. And they have just about every one of them. So, how do you find the things that have been typed wrong? There's a simple solution. Not a good solution, but there's a simple solution. You build a regular expression. So MongoDB supports regular expression searching. Um, the, there's a good algorithm uh, based on, on sort of stemming and hemming distances where you add or remove any one letter, you swap around any two letters, or um, you can add additional letters at the start and end. So I can take a name like Joe and convert it to a regular expression like this and then query the database with the regular expression. There are a few problems with this. Uh, regular expression searches aren't easily indexed. <coughs> they can use quite a lot of CPU. <coughs> and particularly with this one, the size of the regular expression grows with the size of input term. So you see here that Joe is a three-letter name with a nice long regular expression. If the name is Wilhelmina, we have a big regular expression to try and deal with. And the performance, therefore, matches that. Five million records in my sample data, running on MacBook Pro, 45 seconds to find the query result. Now, to be honest, 45 seconds to get a search result for some of the queries that intelligence agencies do is absolutely fine. They, they only have 10 people using their mega database, and they don't mind waiting two minutes for a result. But in the corporate world, that's definitely unacceptable. I've got an example here. I searched for Joseph Steed, but I mistyped Joseph, and it took 91 seconds to come back with those two results. And you can see in the interface, I've asked for all terms to match using the naive, slow method for finding the typos. Above it is the smart one. So there's a smart solution to this, as, as you were hoping, and that's to maintain a vocabulary for your database. So the vocabulary is a second collection table for, for the relational folks that you keep alongside the primary one, which contains only the unique values from that field. So what you do is when you do an insert into the main database, you also do an insert with an upsert capability into the, uh, the vocabulary table where the ID is just the word. So this secondary collection has only one field, ID, the primary key, and that's a unique list of all of the unique first names or last names that were in there, all the unique names. When you come to run your query, don't run it across your terabyte of data. Run it across your unique list of names. This collection will typically only have three or four thousand things in it. It will be hundreds of kilobytes, megabytes at most, and your regular expression will run in milliseconds. It will return you a list of all of the names that match that pattern, and then you use that with an in or an or clause to search the main set of data. So you first get, take your query and expand it, and then you run it against the main set of data. While you're at it, if you're looking for wildcard searching, you could use the same trick. You could run the wildcard against that list of unique values, and then run those as an OR clause against the main database. And if I do the same query against the same set of data using this, it's actually less than one millisecond to come back with the result as opposed to just short 92 seconds. A definite improvement. 
Uh, there are some extra subtleties you can use to speed up the previous one further, and the white paper explains those. The next problem is the wrong box problem. Again, this can be, if you're working with a call center, if the person entering the data is careless, if I'm filling in my own form online, I'm normally quite careful, careful about filling it in, not everyone else is. If I'm talking over the phone to somebody and they're filling in that data, then they will very rarely fill it in carefully. You know, they just want to fill it in as quickly as possible. So how do you deal with data where actually the values are there, but they're all in the wrong field? That's the problem. Forms can be filled in incorrectly. The other one, again, there's a subtlety around the culture. So if I fill in a form and my form says Christian name, family name, well, I know what I'm doing with that. Until I talk to a customer in Korea who says that their name is Kim Jong Un, and okay, Kim, that sounds like a first name. Well, no, they're the other way around. So, you know, unless you understand all these different cultures, Worse still, if you're working in the Middle East, you know, try and ask somebody there what's their Christian name. They don't like that at all. <laughs> you, ask them, you ask them what's their first name and their family name, even that can be quite challenging. So sometimes these forms can be filled in incorrectly or not the way you're expecting. Not because somebody has been careless, just because when you designed the form, you didn't take into account that there are multiple ways to fill it in. One other one, you know, I talked about insurance fraud and the police. Something that happens is people will swap their first and middle names. It's seen as uh, not a big lie if I swap those two things around. And again, it defeats the computer. Plus, I'm sure we all know somebody or have met somebody who doesn't use their first name. You know, they tell you their name is Mary. But actually, Mary is their middle name because their, their first name is Helmut, and they didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's a solution in MongoDB. As we know, MongoDB gives you a slightly richer data structure than your traditional relational table. Which means that instead of having to have a first name and a last name field, or in addition to having a first name and a last name field, you can have a name array, and in that you put all of the names. So you can keep the first name and last name, but you have an array of the names, <coughs> you can query on it, but you don't care about the order. And you build an index on that array, as MongoDB lets you do, allowing you to query for name is this, and not worry about where in the array that appears. So simple example, first name Juan, last name Garcia, names, Juan Colin Garcia. So you insert that record, and when you're querying for a name, query on the names field. Retrie you know, you're likely retrieving both name fields anyway from the main document, but for your query, have your index and perform your query on the names field. If you do this, and again, this is the, the sample application, you can see I've searched for the name Maria, I've ticked the names in any field box. And now I have Maria Jacqueline, but I'm also finding Kim Maria C8. So I'm able to find things where it's been entered into the wrong box. There is an alternate solution, and there are pros and cons to the alternate solution. You can perform a full text search. So especially in MongoDB 2.6, 2.6 release candidate is now out. 2.6 formal release should be this month. You can build a full text index on the name fields, which allow you then to just supply the names and query against the full text index. Good thing is you don't need to have that extra field. So if by adding an array of field names, you're greatly increasing the size of your data, maybe you don't want to do that. On the other hand, you can also only have one free text index on your whole collection. So you have to decide if the names is the thing you want to use that on. And by using an array, you can potentially combine it with other fields. Whereas with a free text index, it's not so easy to combine it and index it with other fields. The way you would do that in 2.6 is you would use ensure index 
to create your index if it doesn't exist, and you would give it field name and the type text. So instead of adding a one or a minus one to say forwards or backwards, you use the, the literal text and that will build a text index. When we're querying, you can do find text, searches, find Garcia, and it will pull that back regardless of the order that they appear in. Is this okay so far? Still understanding? You wouldn't be if I was doing this in German, I promise. <laughs> so the next one we have, uh, it's one of those great computer science things, the specific problem. The problem is that the, I have lots of records that partially match my query, and nothing that exactly matches it. If I do an OR query of all of the attributes, I get far too much. If I do an AND query, I get nothing. What I really want is a kind of weighted score of how well my query matches my data with the best scores at the top. And it is possible to do this in MongoDB. So here, as an example, I use John, James, staff. At least two of those words must match exactly. And I've got a hit, come back, John, James, Spinelli. So I found that because two of those three words match, or two of those words in that field match. Right, the next slide is where it gets scary. Who's used the aggregation pipeline, aggregation framework? For those of you that haven't, you're about to get a crash course. <laughs> so the trick is to, to use the aggregation framework as a query engine. And in fact, in MongoDB, what we're doing is we're merging the aggregation framework and querying together. So the two are becoming much more seamless. In 2.4, aggregation only out a single document with the results in. Whereas in 2.6, like any other query, it returns a cursor and you can iterate through them. The aggregation um, pipeline, for again, for those in the relational world, is, is like taking select and adding the word group to it. So previously in MongoDB you could do select and project, but what you couldn't do was select by group. And there are a number of subtleties around doing that with multi-dimensional objects. So the solution to this is we first perform our query using the aggregation pipeline, but we perform a query of the OR of all of those terms. So as I said, OR will return too many results, because some of them will only have one of those terms. We pass that through the aggregation framework in order to score how well it matched our query. And we either sort or filter by that, returning the IDs of the records that met our threshold. We take that set of IDs and we use it to query to go and retrieve all of those results. So walking through the aggregation pipeline, the aggregation pipeline essentially performs multiple operations Starting with one collection, take the records, perform an operation, put them into a temporary collection, excuse me. Well, I should have turned that off before I started. Am I allowed to use that as a quiz question at the end? Oh, sure. I'm listening. Yeah. I am? Okay, who can name what that tune was? What the what was the tune that was playing on my phone? The Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> we have some prizes to give away. The other questions will be more mobile. Right? <laughs> but that's a particularly good one. So. <laughs> um, so, talking through the aggregation pipeline, it essentially performs an operation on a collection, takes the results of that and puts it into a temporary collection in memory. It then takes the, that collection and passes it to the next thing in the pipeline and the next thing and the next thing. And being a pipeline, these things can be running in parallel. <coughs> so the obvious things it can do, it can do a match. Essentially, that's a query. Find all rows, all, all documents matching this. It can do a project. Take just this subset of fields, sum some fields together, multiply some fields, take some fields and put them into an array. Um, it can also do a group, so take a number of documents where one field is the same 
and collapse them into a single document, perhaps with some aggregate fields. This field summed together, this one average. These fields are getting pushed into a set or an array. So walking through this from the top, the first thing I do is a match. Match um, and do an OR query where first name is John, or last name is Staff, or middle name is James. So what that will do is it will find all documents in the, in the collection we're querying and effectively, in memory, pull them into a temporary data set. The next bit's where it gets hard. So project says take each of these documents and generate, filter the fields. Keep the primary key field, but aside from that, only bring through fields that I tell you to, and those are calculated or copied from the original. So I'm creating a field in here called C, C for count. And in that, I'm going to put the sum with add of three values. Now, I'm going to ask a question that really shocked me in Berlin last night. Who's worked with Microsoft Excel? <laughs> wow. Many more of you than have in Berlin. Who has ever written a function in Microsoft Excel? Great. Would you believe one person out of 25 people had written a function in Excel? I feel so old. <laughs> so, you, if you've seen the syntax in Excel, um, you'll kind of get this syntax. Basically, here it says, if this is equal to this, then this is equal to 1, either or 0. There are also various unpleasant academic languages which use this syntax as well. But basically, this piece will evaluate to a 1 or a 0, depending on whether this clause is true. So, if the first name is equal to John, this will be equal to 1. If the middle name is equal to James, this will be equal to 1. And if the last name is equal to staff, this will be equal to 1. They are all added together and put into this field C. So what comes out of here is a collection that has the ID for the input document and C, which has a value of 1, 2, or 3. Never 0 because of the original OR clause. Basically a score as to how well it matched my query. Why aren't you normalizing it? Because if you have a query with five entries, then the scores are on a different scale than in this query. You, so I mean, I'm, you could be a simple. I'm doing a simple count of how many of okay. my query clauses match. So I'm just I'm just summing the clauses. Oh yeah, since you're only comparing results for one query, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So, so basically, okay. saying is that true? Is that true? Is that true? Score one, two, or three depending on how many things are true. So I then have this conceptual set of records with a score and an ID. So I perform another match, basically a query. Anywhere where C is greater than or equal to 2. I then do a projection of the ID field, so I strip the scores off and return just the IDs. And the reason for this is in MongoDB 2.4, uh, the results are returned in one document which means your result set has a maximum of 16 megabytes. So you want to strip off some of those things. Um, don't include the scores that you don't need them. And then finally, well, so I then run this aggregation. So here, MongoDB is all object. The great thing is you don't have to put all of this into the actual function call. You can create all of the objects separately in JavaScript and then just call it with a list of, of operations to perform. I then take the set of IDs from that and pass that into find. So again, I can take from the document that comes out the list of results and pass it into find. And that will then go and retrieve all documents which score at least um, two on that scale. <coughs> Did you follow that? That's a good job because there's a harder one coming. <laughs> How do you do that if you're working on your way? So how do I do find anything where the array contains at least 
three of these values? So the answer again is, is very similar, but when I get to the, the document with the array, I must unwind the array to make a separate document for each value. Work out the score, and then group the array back together to calculate the score. In 2.6, we actually can shorten this slightly because we have a size of array operator. So we can filter down the array and then just measure the size. <coughs> so the same top level query. So out of that will come every document that contains one of those in that array. I then unwind it. So I will get one document in that temporary data set for every value that was in that array. So if the average person has three names, I will actually have three times as many documents sitting in, in the pipeline, in the, the temporary data set. What I then do is I, I apply the same uh, logic to this, but I basically say, if all names is equal to John, then return John, otherwise blank. If it's equal to staff, return staff, otherwise blank. If it's equal to James, return James, otherwise blank, and concatenate those together. So essentially, for each of those, I say, was this name one of the names in my query, in which case return it, otherwise return blank. So I will then effectively blank out in those documents anywhere where that name wasn't part of my query set. I then need to add that together, so I group them back together. Based on the original document ID, take all of these things which either have blank or have one of the names from my query and roll them back into an array. So I now have a document and a list of only the names which match my query. And so now I have this, or rather only this set of names which match my query. So now I need to just look at the length of that set to determine whether or not it's matched my score. Unfortunately, in MongoDB 2.4, to measure the length of a set, you have to unwind it and group it back together again. Fortunately, it's all pipelined in memory, but I have to do it unwind and group, adding up a sum count of how many things were in there. You can cut those two steps to one. Um, in fact, you can cut those steps entirely and do a length of set in the match in MongoDB 2.6. In 2.4, you have to collapse them into, another, into a score, which you put in C, and then perform a match. And the reason you have to do a greater than or equal to 3 is that some of these names will have turned into a blank. So there will always be one extra item in that set of blank. It will be name, blank, or name, name, blank. And then finally, you project out the ID again and use that as a query. So if you do this, you're able to do John James staff at least two in any field. And this one's an exact match. And I find Murray, James, John, and Nassetti, the same James, John, Spinello, and Orville, John, Ricky, staff. So given two names which could have been in any field, um, and it could have been two names, three names, and finding any two of three, I'm able to find those results. And again, it comes back in less than one millisecond. It's a very efficient technique for doing this on a good set of data. So in summary, um, you can find mistakes in your data. You can query and still find the incorrect entries. You can query with incorrect queries and still often find the results. You can weight and score results. So in those examples, I stripped off the score. But equally, I could have used the aggregation pipeline to sort my score and put the best matches to the top. Um, sometimes you need additional indexes, but there are tricks around this. For example, you don't need an index on a name and on the sound alike of the name. The sound alike index is fairly good. So if you want to do an exact search, query on the sound alike, which uses the index, and the exact name. So make use of the sound alike index to make your actual exact query work quicker. So often with these, you're actually replacing the simple index with um, a, a fancier index which can do the same job. And sometimes you need to add these additional small vocabulary collections.
but the overhead of doing a quick write to a collection which is only a few megabytes is, is nothing. And the benefits you get from being able to um, effectively have the output of a select distinct sitting there ready to, to process are enormous. So, uh, as I said, my name is John Page. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, the code's on GitHub. Uh, my blog is at the bottom where you'll find a full write-up of this along with how to draw fractals and Mandelbrot sets using the aggregation pipeline. Um, uh, and uh, look there for other interesting and exciting things to do with MongoDB. Thank you.